Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. The purpose of this webinar is to discuss the Central Library building's structural issues, why we close the building, and what we can do to remediate it. My name is Peter Brennan, I'm Manager of Property at Wellington City Council, and with me I have Tony Holden, who's a Senior Structural Engineer at Oricon. Oricon have been engaged as Council's uh, consulting engineers for the library issues, and Tony will be helping us uh, through the technical engineering issues for the day. This session is one of the uh, series of public events held to help uh, support Council's public consultation on the Central Library building. And we hope it will assist you so that you can make a submission in terms of this public consultation on how we should treat the library and its future. You will have the opportunity to send us questions throughout the session and we'll probably be responding to most of those towards the end of the session. You can find that option in the chat bar to the side of your screen. As you know, the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016 caused significant damage to many buildings in the Wellington region. This included the, the statistics building on the on Wellington waterfront and the central administration building next door to the library. Both of these buildings suffered damage. And <clears throat> as a result of that uh, earthquake, MB partnered up with the engineering community. They wanted to look at what happened to a number of buildings that were of a similar design feature. This was generally around concrete buildings with precast concrete flooring systems. As a result of this investigation and these discussions with the engineering community, MB issued guidelines in 2018. Given that the Central Library building is a highly flexible building with precast floors, which is the same design features that both the Civic Administration building and Statistics building had, Council decided that it should have an assessment done of that building and asked Oricon to use the MB guidelines that were recently released at that time to undertake an assessment. Oricon's assessment was completed in 2019 and it identified that the building's flooring system had the potential to collapse in a significant earthquake. Council then engaged OPUS to undertake a peer review of Oricon's work and they agreed that the building did have significant structural vulnerabilities and in fact that it had an effective MBS of around about 20%. So from an occupancy and visitor perspective, Council had uh, major concerns around this and it, as it presented a life safety issue for one of, one of Wellington's busiest buildings with over 3,000 3, visitors a day, including large numbers of children. So on the basis of this unacceptable life safety risk, Council made the decision to close the building and investigate what options were available to remediate the building's structural issues. Tony, could you take us through some of those structural issues? Yeah, sure, Thank thanks, you. Peter. Um, I guess to give some context to, to the issues, I'll, I'll just briefly talk about the, um, I guess, the, the original design. Um, the Central Library was constructed as part of Wellington Civic Centre redevelopment during the early 1990s. It was designed in 19, 89 um, to the then current loadings and material standards. So both those standards have um, been superseded and gone through a number of um, revisions <coughs> over the subsequent years. Um, the, the, the building, the, the library, is uh, uh, consists of a series of concrete frames. The floors are primarily uh, precast hollow core units, which we'll cover in more detail later on. Uh, there's a precast concrete um, Cladding panels on three sides of the building. Uh, on the third side, against uh, Civic Square, there's a, a large curved glazed uh, kernel, and the whole building is, is situated on uh, piles in a village of, of ground beams. Now, I guess to put yeah, some of the, um, the issues in perspective, uh, it's important to understand the original design of the concrete frames was designed to what engineers call a capacity design approach. And, and basically what that means is that the beams are designed to, to, to go ductile in a controlled manner in a significant earthquake while protecting the columns from uh, a catastrophic damage and collapse. So Tony, would ductile to a layman be flexible? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And so, um, the, um, so the primary focus is on life safety 
um, not over, say, resilience or, or low damage design. Um, so yeah, part, as part of our um, assessments, as well as other consulting engineers who have looked at the building in the past, the frames are very flexible and uh, expected to, to yield and go ductile. And in this um, characteristic of the building actually uh, is a cause with some of the issues in regards to um, some of what you would say, the secondary elements and the precast walls. So we possibly can put to uh, <clears throat> what we've sort of identified is, is some of the uh, issues with the building. We go to the next slide. Yeah, so as part of our following our initial look at, at the hollow core, which you talked about earlier on, uh, we subsequently looked at the building as a whole, again to the latest guidelines, and the following items are uh, uh, places where we believe a level of retrofit would significantly improve the performance of the building as well as um, address some of its vulnerabilities. So as we talked about, the uh, hollow core precast floor uh, performance, uh, again, due to the flexible nature of the building, um, the central stairs, the way they're designed, um, not allowing what we would say interstory drifts or interstory movements, and so they tend to want to lock up in the event of a large earthquake. Um, in a similar vein, the precast panels, so the precast panels are held to the building with a series of steel connections. Now those connections have not been designed to allow for large movements between floors, and so in the event that that happens, there's uh, a vulnerability there that those connections could be uh, uh, prized off the building and then you would lose support to the heavy precast panels on the outside building. So again, could I jump in? Um, does that mean the floors would fall? As part of what the, the yielding of the frames, the, uh, what happens is there's a geometric type of deformation and also when the, uh, the frames yield, they tend to try to grow apart. And, and one of the issues with the hollow core is the seating on the beams. And so buildings of this era, typically the seating is around 50 millimetres. Uh, it can be used more or less depending on uh, construction tolerance um, and spalling. And so that level of seating, particularly for buildings of this era and the way they're actually connected to the beams can cause issues with uh, uh, both loss of seating and damage to the units themselves, which can um, cause them to collapse in a large event. So, so people might be thinking, well, what, what, what's hollow core? And we've heard that term a lot. So basically hollow core is a, a precast piece of concrete. Um, it's made off site and brought to site and you place them as part of your flooring system. Um, side by side in, in units, and then you've cast a concrete topping over the top. Um, and so there's, in the latest uh, guidelines, C5 guidelines that were released, um, we've always understood there's a seating, a potential seating issue for hollow core, but um, following um, the latest large earthquakes we've had in New Zealand and research into this area, there's been another a number of ways that hollow cores of this era is seen to be um, invulnerable to, to an earthquake. And so there's ways of losing seating as well as damage to the unit. Um, now, this slide here actually shows, I guess, the vulnerable nature of some of the hollow core in the library. Um, this was actually noticed after 2000, the 2013-7 event. Um, it's not known whether it was earthquake related, but there are cracks within some of the units in the building, uh, which have subsequently been uh, retrofitted to, to uh, remove any risk that, that could have possibly been there. So it's not known whether this was earthquake damage, but it shows, I guess, the vulnerable nature inherent in, in some of the, um, the floor units within the building itself. Uh, I did mention uh, the main stairs. Um, the, the picture up in the top right corner shows some damage noticed after the Kaikoura event, and, and that's essentially the building wanting to move uh, during the earthquake and the stairs being locked between floors, and so um, it fights against that, that movement. And so as part of a, a remediation type of solution, we would uh, want to release those connections and allow the, the, the stair to, to slide and not lock up. Uh, we also noted our precast panels. So 
some heavy precast panels on the outside of the building, um, generally they're connected with four steel angles, um, and those angles are not how you would typically design um, fixings of this nature today. And so there's a, a big focus on allowing, again, these movements between floors and, and, and the way the, the panels on, on the library were constructed is that there are some, some steel angles that have some flexibility, but there's a vulnerability in the connections to, to both the building and the panel itself that if, if it was the panel was to lock up in a, a really large earthquake, that you could lose that connection and then lose the, uh, the panel from the outside of the building. So yeah, so those those are the, the main four or five items that have been addressed uh, and identified, and that actually um, they do share common traits with a lot of buildings of, of this constructed in this area. So Tony, would it be fair to say that um, around this time, um, at the, and by this time I mean when the MB guidelines were released, the engineering community was um, uh, grappling is probably a bit strong, but was was coming to terms with how that um, new information from the Kaikoura earthquake would be applied in terms of assessments and in fact remediation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's there's been a wealth of research into this area, and I guess following these these large events, the the consequences um, in regards to some of these secondary elements is more well understood and the relative risk that they pose and so there's an increasing focus on not just looking at the main structure but all of these other parts of the building mm -hmm. that do cause you know can you know uh cause a, a life safety hazard and, and and there's been a lot of research into how to to mitigate those um, mm -hmm. in a existing building stock so so in light of that um developing knowledge uh, council um undertook to hold a technical workshop around that time that involved um, Oricon and a number of other senior engineers from around the region and also included uh, architecture and construction specialists. Um, the, the thinking around having a workshop was, was that we could canvas a wide variety of views so we could better understand um, where to next. And, and that uh, technical workshop was really the prompt for the work that um, Tony and the team have been doing since that time in terms of remediation design. Um, Tony, thoughts on the, the technical workshop and, and the work that came out of that? Yeah, well, yeah, having a, a full room full of engineers, it's, it's always hard to, to get an exact, exact uh, consensus on things. Uh, I, I would say that the items and the issues raised or identified with library are not ones that uh, are surprising for, for a construction of this type and of this era. Um, so there was consensus on, I guess, the fundamental aspects of the building that would uh, benefit from, you know, having some retrofit done. Um, a lot of the solutions to, to some of these ish issues are quite standard type of um, repairs and uh, retrofit. Um, panels, connections can be, can be swapped with other kind of panels seating angles for the whole core units. So some of the standard approaches are, are well accepted within the industry. Yeah. yeah. But it's always good to to have a a, a consensus view on these things and, and to have you know, um, ideas and, and ways of addressing some of these issues challenged by others. So mm -hmm. this, there, there was great uh, value in, in getting um, everyone in the room to discuss. And I think um one of the important themes that we tried to get through to the to the workshop was was that life safety is critical, obviously, but we wanted to take the um, the thinking a bit further than that uh, into the field of resilience, uh, building resilience, which um, I guess simply put is how the building fares um, during and after an earthquake, rather than just addressing the life safety matters. Um, we were concerned around what would the building be like after an event. Yeah, so as you, as you said, you can address those those immediate life safety issues relatively uh, in a rather relatively straightforward manner when you're looking at adding additional resilience to the library. Uh, there's you know, different approaches that you can take at different levels 
to which you can add that resilience. So as part of our ongoing work and, and looking at um, strengthening options for the library, um, all options will address all of the life safety hazards that the building currently uh, has um, in terms of adding additional resilience. Um, one of the fundamental things that we see is, is to reduce the flexibility flexibility of the building. And so uh, to do that, uh, we're looking at adding some, some, some additional steel frames into the building to stiffen it up, and that helps uh, alleviate some of the, I guess, the deformation incompatibility between a flexible frame and some of these secondary elements that are inherently brittle. Um, on top of that, the gold standard is, 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 is usually seen as a base isolated building, and so we're looking at all of those steps along the way in terms of adding uh, the different levels of resilience. And, and a lot of this is um, as a result of the building's age, um, in the sense that it was built to, to the, the right standard in the day, uh, but we have moved on an awful lot in the 30 years since that building was designed. Um, and in that context, one of the other elements of the building is the building services. Um, and these are all 30 odd years old themselves now. And, and by building services, um, I'm referring to the plant and equipment that deals with um, heating and cooling and plumbing and fire protection, electrical and those sorts of things. And so what we are looking at doing is taking advantage of the quite intrusive work that you would need to do to remediate the building and uh, upgrade these services as part of the, uh, the work with um, Tony probably um, would agree that we are going, this is a best opportunity um, to, to upgrade these services in the sense that the building is closed and that we are doing some quite intrusive work. Correct, correct. And it's always good to, to, to try to do all those types of works at the same time when the building mm -hmm. isn't occupied. And in terms of, of um, addressing some of the fundamental issues with the building, as you said, the building has been designed to a process and I guess the life safety was the, the main driver, particularly for buildings of that era. Society has moved on, learnings have moved, moved on, and so to add additional resilience is, is, is definitely something that people would like to see, and it's just a matter of how, how much intrusive um, works you need to do and the costs associated with those two to, to bring the library up sure. to that level of resilience. Um, you, you've touched on the, the various, um, I guess, remediation works that um, that you start to contemplate both during the technical workshop and then the subsequent work that you've been doing. Um, do you want to take us through in a bit more detail um, the, the, the various remediation schemes that, that the team has been working on? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> in regards to the hollow core units, um, the main issue with those are the seating. And so to remediate those, uh, a, a simple angle to increase the level of seating for the unit is uh, will get you to a certain um, MBS rating, you could say, or a, a certain performance level. Um, at that point, you go on to the next potential issues with a, with a hollow core, which is not just the feeding, but how the, the units are forced to form and, and potentially break away from the, the support. Um, best way to deal with that is actually not to have those deformations occur. In, in, and to, to, to increase, I guess, the performance of the hollow core, one way is to stiffen the building so it doesn't actually have to go through those, those um, displacements that the, the flexible frame wants to do. And so as part of uh, the work that we're looking at at the moment is to introduce some, some new steel frames, which will take, I guess, the majority of the earthquake loads um, away from the existing uh, frames of the building. Um, that helps both um, in terms of the resilience because the, 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 the building is, is deforming in a, 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 to a greater or less extent um, and also it doesn't require um, the, the, the existing frame to, to yield and bend and so after an event you're more likely to not have significant damage to the existing building and you can then quite readily assess um, where damage is in regards to the new parts that you've placed in. Uh, 
um, a step above that is uh, base isolation. Um, that is really is the gold standard, I guess, in terms of adding resilience to the building. Um, such a, uh, a, a solution would require an isolation system to be introduced. Usually that is at ground level, at the basement level. Um, there would still be some uh, re uh, retrofit and remediation to, to the structure, but to a, to a lot less extent, you would probably still want to be looking at the, uh, the, the connections to the facade um, and, and, and some seating angles potentially in, in some areas. Uh, but introducing base isolation does, I guess, take away the work that the structure would usually have to, to, to go through um, during a larger so each of those schemes that you've referenced are um, in the statement of proposal, which is um, this document here, which um, is um, the, the base document for our consultation on the Central Library. <coughs> and um, in that document, we talk about those three remedi remediation schemes and two potential new build um, opportunities that, that might arise. Um, the three schemes that you've just referred to, uh, low, you know, mid and, and high resilience. Um, and we'll just have a look at that now um, in the document itself. So as we move through the document, um, we get to the point where the three schemes are um, described that um, Tony was just talking about and um, the low, mid and um, high level um, or base isolation option. So um, please do look at the, the statement of proposal. Um, it's a useful um, guide for those that are interested in making submissions in terms of the, um, the consultation process that we're in at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I think it's also useful to tell people that we're currently going through quite a robust process. So Oricom have done, um, uh, moved into, um, would it be fair to say, almost developed design um, of the, 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 um, the three schemes. And um, we're testing that with um, additional consultancies. We have architecture, um, construction and independent engineer all looking at these designs as they're being done, almost in a live context, so that we're getting the best result from those um, those schemes. And again, sort of testing um, the work that, that you know that Oricon's doing for us. Um, and then, furthermore, we will also be going through a peer review process where a panel of, um, of engineers will uh, provide commentary on the three schemes that um, the Tony and the team um, have been putting together. Um, I think for the moment um, that just about wraps up the sort of the background conversation um, and and I think we have some questions. Um, thank you. So, <clears throat> so um, a question that's come through for Tony, it's, um, and I knew this would probably come and I was um, <laughs> about to jump in, is what is deformation? Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah, engineering spec. Um, when we refer to deformations, it's basically when you have an earthquake, everything moves. Um, deformations come from the movement floor to floor and also movement from the floor uh, following a, a, a bended shape like this. Um, <coughs> substitute deformations for displacement or, uh, or movement within the building. Um, what we're concerned about primarily is when those deformations or those movements become greater than what the, uh, the, the members of the structure can handle in an elastic or non-damaged type of state. And, and it's past that state where the, uh, the robustness and the vulnerabilities of some of the elements um, will, will can potentially occur. So it would stretch beyond its um, appropriate form and not return. Yes, and, and, and I guess the, the, the design of the library was with these inelastic deformations in mind, but that deformations, inelastic deformations, you can, I guess, equate to damage within the structure. Sure. So the structure is allowed to damage in a controlled way and, and, and protect elements that 
um, would potentially cause a collapse. And so what we're trying to do is limit those deformations to, to increase the resilience of the building. Sure, thank you. Um, a second question that I have sent here. Um, you have said that the central administration building next door to the central library building is damaged from the Kaikoura quake. It's a similar age and design. Uh, why wasn't the library damaged? Yeah, um, well, both buildings have similar features, um, but there, is, there are some differences, I guess, in their orientation and the ground that they're founded on. Um, unfortunately, in the case of the Kaikoura event, that particular earthquake had a frequency content and an orientation that was particularly critical for the CAB building. Um, every earthquake is different. Um, if we had a similar sized earthquake that had a, a different orientation or duration, different uh, frequency content within the waves, uh, we could have had equally significant damage in the library as well. Sure. Um, so, a bit of luck in terms of direction. Um, there's, there, there, you could say that, yeah. Okay. I know you wouldn't. Um, um, we, we've touched on this throughout the conversation, but we have a question that says, it's my understanding that Council already knew about the other structural issues um, that the building had from an earlier assessment. Why weren't these addressed and uh, what changed um, resulted in the closure in 2019? Um, it, it is true, we had earlier uh, engineering assessments that identified some of the things that Tony had talked about. Um, these issues didn't present the, the level of life safety risk that we uh, understood from the 2019 report. And Council was planning to address these issues. Um, however, they did result or require the building to be closed uh, to attend to these. And so it was a, it was a decision that we wouldn't take lightly. Um, and, and during that planning period, we became aware that MB and the engineering community were in fact um, starting to do their thinking around pre precast concrete floors. So we thought it was prudent uh, just to understand that a lot better before we closed the building and started that other work. Um, and then of course the Kaikoura earthquake struck and um, we, we, the, the process went from there. Um, <clears throat> another one for Tony here. Um, why are the costs for remediation so much higher than a new build? I guess that's a good question. Um, when you when you are completing a retrofit or, or a strengthening of the building, you're you're essentially breaking down all of the structure to then rebuild it up in, in, in a different form. And so a lot of the cost is trying to make the building do something that it wasn't originally intended to do. Sure. Um, a lot of the time when you have to do these works, you have to remove linings and services and, and other parts of the building and then and, and rebuild those back afterwards. So there's uh, both a, a rebuild component and a, a demolishing type component. And so the more you try to, I guess, push the structure away from how it was originally uh, designed and, and built, um, those costs can, can, can grow quite significantly. Thank you. Um, uh, this question, if I understand the document correctly, what you're saying is, is that option D is the best option. I'm not quite sure the option, uh, the, the document says it's the best option, that uh, perhaps it's the conclusion that someone has drawn. Um, however, there is a risk that this building might become a heritage building, so might it have to uh, go to that option instead. Um, it is true the building has been, um, there is a request to, to list this as a heritage building. Um, that is going through the process right now. We don't know what the outcome of that might be. I think regardless of whether it is listed as heritage, I think there's an awful lot of people that um, uh, would prefer that the building um, is remediated. Um, and that is just one of the questions that we're facing. Um, preservation of the building is um, obviously something that has been signalled by council as being the preferred option and um, we're working through that process at the moment. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you give a breakdown of the structural remediation and interior fit out for each option? Um, is that in relation to, I'm wondering whether that question is referring to costs? Um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's the case. Um, there's probably three or four components to each of the um, each of the schemes. Uh, there's the structural element, um, and but within that structural element, there is um, a lot of what we would refer to as make good. So you're basically having to, um, as Tony just said, remove uh, parts of the building to able to get to the, the structure beneath, um, and that needs to be um, remediated. During that time, you might take the opportunity to refresh. And so the lines between sort of, I guess, upgrade or fit out and structure are quite blurred at times in the sense that you're having to pull off wall linings and, and probably destroy, destroy floor coverings, et cetera. Um, so there is a, there is a, um, a difference. That the, the real, I guess, fit out element is as if we were to remodel the building from its previous use. And those numbers are um, shown in the in the statement of proposal um, for each of the options. And I don't propose to go through them here, but if you do refer to that document, you can see each of them um, is referenced in, in that document. Um, question here about sea level rise. Um, how would a remediation building address the issue of sea level rise? Tony. In terms of the building itself, uh, base isolation does give you a, a, a ready way of uh, lift, uh, basically raising the, the building up, um, which could then be set to a level above what would be considered uh, a building lifetime sea level rise. Um, outside of the building, um, other options in regards, I guess, to civic square and a, a wider approach to uh, addressing that, that issue. But so, yeah, potentially um, the issue is not building related, it is um, precinct, wider city related, yeah. and, and we might cause ourselves um, some interesting outcomes if we were just to deal with one building, is that? Yeah, I think yeah. You, you have to see it, and I guess, in, in, with, with both lenses in terms of, you know, as you said, a, a precinct level and an individual building level. Mm -hmm. and how that, uh, if you do it on a building level, how then will that building relate to the, the, the rest of uh, the area? The, the yeah, area, exactly. Um, but having said all of that, um, there is an opportunity to lift the floor level during a base isolation um, scheme. Yeah at, yeah, at the time when you introduce the um, the uh, base isolators, that's the time when you can actually raise the, the building effectively to, to uh, the level that you desire. Okay. Um, staying with base isolation, um, would council consider base isolating a new building? Well, yes, of course, um, Council would. Um, I, I guess that's in, in response to the um, the options that are shown in the uh, the statement of proposal. Um, the two new build options are high resilient options, uh, but don't uh, necessarily include base isolation. Um, I, I guess the the thinking really around um, resilience is, is that base isolation is um, probably the the gold-plated version of, 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 um, of high resilience. Having said that, you can achieve a very high level of resilience without base isolation. But if we were to um, build a new building, certainly base isolation would be um, would be considered, um, and it would probably uh, involve five to ten percent um, more cost than the um, higher uh, re um, resilient building that we've costed out. Um, bearing in mind that they are very high level costs on those new buildings. Um, in the sense that we haven't done design at this stage. <clears throat> what about the proposal that addresses the key structural issues for 10 million? Uh, why isn't it an option to stage the work and, and do the work later? Um, I'm not sure about the reference to $10 million. Um, uh, I think we'd probably struggle to achieve um, much with $10 million in relation to um, taking Tony's thinking into account about the amount of um, building work we have to undo uh, before we can even do any remediation. Um, but in terms of staging the work, um, 
that is a potential option to take the low scheme in the first instance. The difficulty with that is, is that you're closing the building on multiple occasions um, and you're also uh, revisiting the building on multiple occasions. It would work out to be significantly more expensive um, and during that time you haven't got a resilient building until you get to the, let's say, the top level. Um, so it wasn't considered to be a, um, a suitable option in, the, in that sense. Um, it doesn't achieve the outcomes that, um, that, that um, we ultimately want and that is a safe, resilient building. Um, I don't seem to have any more questions here. Are there any more that have come through? Um, I think we've got one coming through. Two minutes. Sure. To what extent does remediation limit redesign? So the question is, to what extent does remediation limit redesign? Um, I guess it's a question of cost and opportunity. Uh, in the lowest of the schemes, um, the opportunity is probably very small because you're not really um, uh, doing much to the building, if you're to say, Tony, you're, uh, in terms of um, creating the opportunity for opening up, um, I don't know, to the, to the civic precinct, for example, or um, uh, remodelling the, the internal fit-out because you're really um, addressing the, the floor seatings um, and the external panels and the stair, um, and that's not particularly intrusive. Um, to the building itself. As you move, move up through the levels, you do more intrusive work, and so it presents an opportunity to remodel. Um, and so therefore, effectively, the, the cost is, um, uh, it's more economic in that sense, in the sense that you've got to make good the work that you've already done. So um, hence why the schemes tend to work in that fashion, in the sense that there is a greater level of remodeling at the, um, at the higher end of the schemes. Um, and there's a reasonable opportunity to do that with a base isolation because it's quite intrusive work. So just checking, we have, um, it seems, no more questions. So um, let me just check that we don't. Oh, here we go. We do have one. Mm -hmm. Will the exterior water feature be removed? Um, will the exterior water feature be removed is the question. Um, we, there's a likelihood um, that it would need to be, for, well, a certainty, I think, for base isolation in the sense that you need to create um, a space around the building for the building to move, we call a rattle zone. Um, and so in that sense, it probably would need to be um, removed. Um, with the other schemes, it wouldn't be necessary as such um, to remove it. Um, just checking, no, no more questions have come through. Um, so, um, as we know that the, um, the, the statement of proposal and the consultation process will feed into our long-term plan, so it is critical that everybody um, who's interested provides us with a submission so that we can feed that into our recommendations along with the design work uh, towards the um, end of the year, October, November, for our long-term pro process, long-term plan process. Um, so please go to the Council's website um, and um, have a look at the page, click on the submission um, and do that. It closes on at 5pm on, on Monday um, and so um, please get in before then. So thanks to Tony um, and everyone who was watching today and um, don't forget to put your submission in and that's goodbye from us. Thank you. <laughs>